caring for your family treasures. What does preservation mean when it comes to caring for family treasures? Essentially, preservation prolongs the life of your heirlooms. It minimizes the changes that affect them and slows their inevitable deterioration. Preservation is a series of steps you can take right now to ensure that treasured heirlooms last for generations. Most artifacts are made up of organic materials and they will deteriorate over time in some way. How they deteriorate depends on the type of material and what are known as internal and external factors. Some of the most common artifacts found in family and personal collections are made up of the following materials. Paper. Most paper made before 1800 was known as rag paper because it was made from used cotton, linen, or hemp rags. The long plant fibers present in the cloth produced very strong paper. Starting in the second half of the 19th century, the quality of paper decreased and eventually became more brittle and acidic due to the introduction of two things in the manufacturing process, wood pulp and sizing. Wood pulp contains lignin, an organic substance found in plants that makes cell walls strong and rigid. Over time, the lignin chemically degrades and makes paper acidic. Sizing is a treatment applied during paper manufacture that reduces paper's absorption of liquid and determines its finished feel. Other factors like exposure to light, both artificial and natural, high temperatures, and pollutants can also accelerate paper's decomposition. In addition, manuscript and printing ink can be acidic. It will transfer to adjacent materials, acidic images and books can actually burn into the paper on the opposite page, and it can damage paper by eating away at it over time. Textiles. Most textiles were functional objects, so their deterioration is determined by their history of use, how they were handled, and environmental factors. Fabrics made from natural fibers especially are susceptible to damage from light exposure, both artificial and natural. Light fades colors and weakens fibers over time. Unfortunately, light damage is cumulative and irreversible. Other factors that affect textiles are high temperatures and humidity, pests like mice and insects, pollutants, mold and mildew, and naturally acidic dyes. Ceramics. These are categorized as earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. Ceramics are clay bodies that vary in their degree of porosity or how easily liquids are able to pass through them. Earthenware ceramics are fired at relatively low temperatures and are considered porous. Stoneware ceramics are fired at mid-range temperatures and have strong semi-porous bodies. And porcelain is fired at high temperatures and is non-porous. Ceramics, ceramics can be plain or decorated with slip, glaze, paint, enamel, or gilding. Some of these treatments, <clears throat> like glazing, can provide better water impermeability, especially in the case of earthenware. Ceramics are relatively, re relatively resistant to environmental factors, but can deteriorate, mainly due to accidental breaking or cracking. This can be caused by improper handling or storage and poor manufacturing methods and materials. Extreme and rapid temperature fluctuations can cause expansion and contraction between the ceramic body and decoration layers, resulting in bracket breaking and cracking. Metals. Metals are produced from ores found in nature and are processed from a stable mineral state to a less stable metallic state. Most metals, with the exception of gold and sterling silver, are alloys or a mixture of more than one metal. These alloys deteriorate through corrosion caused by contact with water, acids, oils, and salts, all of which can be transferred from your skin, as well as polishes and chemicals used to clean. Gold will not corrode, neither will silver, but it will tarnish. As I mentioned earlier, the factors that affect all materials can be categorized as internal and external. Internal factors are weaknesses that are formed in the manufacturing process. You have no control over these and probably aren't even aware of their existence. They sort of sneakily deteriorate your artifacts over time. External factors are things that affect an object after it's been made, like heat, humidity, artificial and natural light, pollution, pests, poor storage choices, and improper handling. These are factors you do have control over and can do something about. 
So where do you start? Start with your storage environment. You want to keep heirlooms in a space where a stable, steady temperature and relative humidity can be maintained. So no attics, basements, or garages or sheds. General recommendations for artifact storage are about the same as those for people. Remember, your collections live where you do. Let's start with temperature. The lower, the better, but since you don't live in archival storage, around 70 degrees is fine, give or take a few degrees. You also want to avoid storing anything next to radiators or vents. Relative humidity, which is the amount of moisture in the air, should be between 35 and 55%. Basically, you want the environment to be on the drier side. High humidity can lead to mold, which not only causes damage to your belongings, but can be a serious health hazard. Light, both natural and artificial, is extremely damaging to artifacts. If you can't store or display your heirlooms in a windowless, windowless room with low light, store them in a relatively cool, dark space, like a closet or under the bed. Finally, keep the area clean. Avoid food and drink near your artifacts and dust regularly so as not to introduce pests like mice and insects. Storage and display furniture. Powder coated steel is best, so metal cabinets and filing cabinets are actually a good option, but you may not like the aesthetic. Most furniture in your house is probably made of wood, which is acidic. Certain paints and stains used can also off gas and affect what you're storing or displaying. Using shelf lining or protective enclosures will act as a buffer. Let's talk about the kind of protective enclosures you'll wanna to use to store your artifacts. Enclosures and supplies include boxes of all sizes and shapes, folders, paper, tissue paper, plastic sleeves, and bags. First off, you wanna buy from reputable archival supply companies like Gaylord, University Products, and Archival Methods, to name a few. Always buy new products, no recycled material. When shopping for supplies, look out for these terms acid-free. This refers to the product's pH level of 6.0 or greater at the time of its manufacture. This means that acid can still migrate from another object to acid-free materials and affect them. That's why it's even more important that products are labeled lignin-free. This is the organic substance found in wood pulp that breaks down and becomes acidic over time. So even if a product is acid-free, if lignin is present, acid will still form. You may see the terms buffered and unbuffered. Buffered storage materials have an alkaline substance added to them to counteract acids that may form in the material in the future. Most items can benefit from being stored in buffered material with some exceptions. Artifacts that contain animal protein like wool, silk, and leather, certain types of photographs like dye transfer prints and cyanotypes, and blueprints. So if you're in doubt as to the material, use unbuffered. For photograph storage, make sure products have passed the PAT or photo activity test. This is an international standard that tests the possibility of chemical interactions between photographs and a given material after prolonged contact. Archival suppliers will indicate this in the product description. Finally, when purchasing archival plastics like sleeves or bags, you want an inert, stable plastic. So look for polyester, sometimes known as mylar, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Never use PVC or polyvinyl chloride because it's unstable and deteriorates quickly, which can cause damage to objects, especially photos. When you're ready to move collections out of the basement or garage and into a better storage environment, it's a good idea to inspect for any kind of damage and control it if possible. With paper and textiles, you want to look out for insects like silverfish, carpet beetles, and clothes moths, and note any damage they've caused. Silverfish like paper, glue, and dried food, and will eat through paper and books, as seen here. Carpet beetles eat through wool, fur, silk, and feathers. Webbed clothes moths make holes in fabric like wool, fur, and silk. To clean textiles, brush off and or gently vacuum in a well-ventilated area preferably outside, weather permitting. Another issue to look out for in paper and textiles is mold. It's often detected by a musty smell and is handled differently depending on the type. Always wear gloves and other protective gear when dealing with mold. The two different types of mold are active and inactive. 
active mold seen here can appear fluffy and may, may feel wet and smear when touched. You shouldn't try to clean off this type of mold. It must be contained first, separated from other objects, and then deactivated. You also want to figure out the reason for the mold outbreak in the first place and try to address that problem. Inactive mold seen here is dry and powdery and will cause staining even after it's removed. You can clean inactive mold to reduce the possibility of future outbreaks and it will make objects safer to handle. The Northeast Document Conservation Center, or NEDCC, has a free preservation leaflet on their website with the steps you need to take to deal with active and inactive mold. Just look for how to salvage moldy books and papers under the emergency management section. If faced with a disaster like fire or flooding, there are steps you can take to help stabilize your collections and buy you time to make an educated decision on further treatment. You can consult the preservation leaflets I mentioned earlier or visit the FEMA website for steps to save your family treasures. Now I'm gonna go over some typical types of artifacts you may have in your family collection. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but a lot of the basic principles I talk about can be applied to different types of heirlooms. I'll discuss how to handle the object, prepare it for storage, reformat or document it, and store it properly. Let's start with paper documents. These are vital records like birth and death certificates, letters, wills, deeds, and ephemera. Handle paper with clean, dry hands without hand lotion so as not to transfer oils and possibly damage the paper. There's no need to use gloves, although you may want to if the papers you're going through are particularly dirty. Carefully remove rusty staples, pins, and paper clips without tearing. Remove rubber bands, string, or ribbon. Separate letters and other documents from envelopes, but keep them together, especially if there's information on the envelope. Flatten and unfold documents if you can. If the paper is too brittle, don't force it. You may wish to photocopy or scan at this stage so you can consult the facsimile and protect the original. Use copies to make transcriptions and share with your family. You can keep these copies in a binder so they're easily accessible. Store paper documents by first placing in acid-free folders. And from here on out, when I say acid-free, know that I also mean lignin-free as well. Make sure the folder is big enough to cover the entire document. You can add more than one document to a folder, just make sure it's not overfilled. For added protection, especially with fragile paper that's brittle or torn, use Mylar L sleeves. These are open on two sides, so it's easy to place the document inside. Finally, store the folders in a box. It can be flat or an upright document style like this. If it is vertical, make sure the folders fill the box and don't slouch. You may need to use acid-free material as a spacer, or you can lay the box on its side. Another artifact you may have in your possession is the family Bible, or any book that is special to your family. Again, handle with clean, dry hands, unless the leather, is co leather cover is flaking and powdery, then you'll want to wear gloves. If this is the case, your Bible or any leather-covered book may be experiencing red rot, this is a process of leather deterioration that appears most commonly as red dust on the surface of the leather. It's not completely understood, but believed to be caused by the presence of strong acids that may have been added in the tanning process. The best course of action is to handle as little as possible and store properly. When looking at your Bible, you may want to support it by using a book cradle. You can make your own by rolling up clean towels and placing on either side of the spine or resting the book on a soft pillow. Remove any inserts like clippings, prayer cards, and mementos and store them in a separate folder. These inserts can be acidic and can cause staining or cause the uh, binding to slip, split and warp. If there are Bible records like those seen here, you can carefully remove them if you want and keep them separately. If you'd like to keep the Bible intact, it will probably be difficult to scan or photocopy the pages, so take a picture and refer to the image for your family genealogy. Finally, wrap the Bible in acid-free tissue if you want added protection, especially if red rot is present. Remember to use unbuffered materials if the Bible is covered in leather. You can store in a clamshell or lidded box that fits the dimensions of the Bible as close as possible, or a phase box, which is a four-flap enclosure, enclosure that fits around the book. 
Newspapers and clippings can be difficult and frustrating to deal with due to the fact that some 19th century and most 20th century newsprint is extremely acidic. This means it can be brittle, as I mentioned earlier when talking about paper. Handle these documents with clean, dry hands and with care, because depending on how they were previously stored, they can completely fall apart. For that reason, it's recommended that clippings and pertinent parts of a newspaper be photocopied or scanned. If you do decide to keep clippings or newspapers, carefully remove rusty paper clips and staples and unfold if you can. There are several options for storage. The main takeaway is to isolate newsprint from the rest of your papers to ensure there's no acid migration. In other words, you don't want newsprint to discolor and affect your other documents. Keep clippings in their own acid-free folders or envelopes. You can use archival plastic bags or sleeves, flat boxes, or binders. Photographs. Here I'm talking about loose photos that aren't in albums, or at least not pasted down in an album. I'll be talking about that next. This is one of the few times when you should wear gloves when handling photos. It prevents you leaving fingerprints or oils on the surface of the photo. Nitrile gloves that fit your hands are recommended over cotton gloves because they allow for a more tactile sensation and you'll be less likely to damage the photo. Nitrile gloves can be found at pharmacies, grocery stores, or places like Home Depot. Organize your photos by date, person, or event, and identify if you can by writing on the back with a soft pencil using light pressure. If the photos are on a slick paper, use a pen with acid-free archival quality ink, like a Zig memory system pen or a Pigma Micron pen by Sakura. If you want to display photos, scan and print the original or make a color photocopy and frame the facsimile. Light, both natural and artificial, is one of the worst things for photos. It causes a lot of damage. Here is a copy of a photograph in our collection. This was framed and hanging in someone's office. The lights in the office reacted with the printer ink, turning the copy green. You can see the original color that was under the frame. Now just imagine if this was an actual photograph. Okay, let's talk about storage. A good option is to use archival plastic sleeves. Make sure they are PAT passed as we discussed earlier. The good thing about plastic sleeves is that they come in all different sizes and you can put two photos back to back in one pocket unless you want the back of the photo to be visible. A brand to look out for is Printfile. You can purchase directly from their website as well as other archival suppliers and even Amazon. Sleeves can go in a three ring binder as seen here for easy accessible viewing. Binders should be stored horizontally so they don't warp and the sleeves sag unless you get a binder slipcase, but these can be pricey. You can also keep sleeves of photos in folders and document boxes like this. You can keep photos organized further by writing on the folders. Make sure the box is filled, but not bulging. If there is a gap, use some kind of acid-free spacer so the folders don't sag. You can also store this type of box on its side. Larger size photos can be stored in flat boxes. Scrapbooks and albums are made from a wide range of material, often fragile, poorly adhered, and easily damaged, so use caution when handling. Clean, dry hands are fine because you're not likely to touch the actual photographs, but you will touch the pages. Of course, use gloves if you do need to handle the photos. For the most part, we like to keep scrapbooks and albums intact. It honors the creator's intention and other elements are pasted in and or there's writing on the pages, so it's best to preserve the book as a whole. If photos or ephemera are rubbing against each other on facing pages, or there's exposed adhesive or anything that can damage materials when the book is closed, you can interleave acid-free tissue, paper, or mylar between the pages. If you have photos in one of those magnetic self-stick photo albums, sticky cardboard pages covered by plastic sheets, you may wanna transfer the photos to sleeves or another more archival friendly album especially if the photos have been discolored because of the acidic pages. If the photos won't come off easily, at least remove the plastic sheets. If the pages are still sticky, interleave with pieces of mylar. Because scrapbooks in particular can be delicate, you don't want to handle them too much. You can make a facsimile scrapbook to look at instead. Using a book cradle, here I'm resting the book open on a soft pillow, take pictures of each page. If photos or whole pages can be easily removed and put back in order, you can scan them. 
Scrapbooks and photo albums should ideally be stored horizontally, preferably in appropriately sized archival boxes, because they'll keep out damaging light and dust. Otherwise, make sure they're stored in a dark space, like a closet. Textiles can be quilts, blankets, baby clothes, wedding dresses, samplers, and other embroidery. Again, handle with clean, dry hands and with care. When looking over textiles, take off any jewelry that could snag or pull fabric and threads. Before storing textiles, give them a light dusting. Use a piece of mesh screening, like a mesh ironing cloth, and vacuum through it with the vacuum set to a low suction. Before storing, photograph your textiles. Record as much information as you can, like the creator, year, materials, pattern, and original recipient. If you want to keep a copy of this information with the textiles themselves, print it out or write in pencil on acid-free paper and include in the box. Textiles should be stored flat and out of direct light, ideally in archival boxes. Alternately, you could cover a quilt, for example, in a white towel or cotton fabric, like a piece of muslin or even a bed sheet, and keep it in a closet. Another alternative is using a dresser drawer, but in that case, make sure to line the drawer with cotton fabric and or acid-free tissue paper. As I mentioned earlier, wood is acidic, so you want a buffer between it and your textiles. When placing textiles like clothing and quilts in a box, you want to create as few folds as possible. Pad out the folds of tissue, cotton fabric, or white towels to reduce the stress caused by the folds. You can see rolled up tissue used here. Remember to use unbuffered materials if the textiles are made of or contain wool, silk, or leather. Make sure to inspect your textiles periodically, ideally at six month intervals, to check for pest infestation or other deterioration, and if folded like a quilt, refold differently before putting it back in its box. Ceramics and glassware. These can be porcelain, earthenware, stoneware, art glass, sculpture, kitchenware, and dinnerware. In most cases, you just need clean, dry hands when handling ceramics and glass. You may want to wear gloves for unglazed ceramics or ceramics with gilding or luster so as not to damage surface finishes. The greatest risk to ceramics and glassware, as I mentioned earlier, is improper handling and carelessness. Support objects evenly with both hands and avoid placing weight along rims, handles, or knobs. Keep ceramics and glassware free from dust and debris by using a lint-free duster for stable glazed ceramics and glass or a soft bristle brush for unglazed ceramics or intricate surfaces. Avoid washing decorative pieces too often because there's a greater risk of breakage. Porous ceramics like, earth, like earthenware will absorb water like a sponge and draw surface stains deeper into the ceramic body if left to soak. Liquids left inside glass can actually dissolve the glass itself into the liquid, causing the inside of the vessel to appear cloudy. Keep a record of what you have by taking photos of your collection. Document any information you can gather about the maker, year, material, original recipients, etc. Ceramics and glassware are not as affected by light as paper and textiles, but extreme temperature and humidity fluctuations should still be avoided, especially in the case of ceramics, since it could cause expansion and contraction, which may lead to surface cracking or breaking. Store and display objects on sturdy level surfaces that are secure from bumps and vibrations away from edges and ideally protected from major dust accumulation. If you wanna pack up these objects for long-term long storage, wrap in acid-free tissue paper and store in sturdy acid-free boxes. Avoid using newspapers for wrapping because they're acidic and can cause discoloration and staining. Metal objects. These may be tableware, kitchenware, jewelry, and toys, to name a few. Oils and salts from your skin can cause corrosion and pitting on most metals, so gloves are recommended when handling. Noble metals like gold don't corrode at all, and sterling silver will tarnish, but is unlikely to corrode unless under very aggressive conditions. Keep metal objects free of dust, debris, and oily residues. Dust and debris in the air can land on metals, trap moisture, and encourage corrosion. Don't routinely polish or aggressively clean metals because each time you do, a thin layer of the surface is actually ground off by cleaning tools, abrasives and polish, or dissolved by strong chemicals and cleaning solutions. 
It's best to use mild and non-abrasive methods for cleaning. Again, keep a record of your collection by taking photos and document any information you can gather about the maker, year, material, original recipients, etc. As I mentioned, one of the main things you want to avoid with metals is corrosion. Wooden cabinets and shelving can emit acids and other gases that cause metal to corrode, so use some type of barrier between the metal object and the shelf, like cotton, linen, or silver cloth. Silver cloth is a cotton flannel fabric that prevents sterling silver and silver plate from tarnishing. Pacific silver cloth is one brand to look for. If you wanna pack up your metal objects, wrap them in acid-free tissue, cotton fabric, or silver cloth, and place in sturdy acid-free boxes. Make sure there is adequate padding around the objects to ensure the metal surfaces don't come in contact with each other. To store metal jewelry, wrap in acid-free tissue or use silver cloth bags and acid-free boxes. Jewelry boxes are fine to use if you wear your jewelry often. Consider lining them with tissue paper or silver cloth, especially if the box is made out of wood. While going over how to preserve different types of artifacts, I mentioned reformatting, especially when it comes to paper documents and photographs. I'm going to talk a little more about that now. Reformatting your objects is another step in the preservation process. It limits handling of the object. As you know, overhandling may lead to damage. It allows for copies to be shared with other family members, and it ensures that an object's information is captured and preserved, even if something happens to the object through possible damage or loss. Reformatting can mean photocopying documents or photos. Do this to create an immediate, usable, physical copy. Scan documents and photos to create a digital preservation copy. This involves extra steps and requires maintenance on your part, which I'll discuss next. There are a couple different ways to capture and digitize your documents and photos, but the best is to use a flatbed scanner. I'm gonna go over the basics here, but if you want a more in-depth discussion of how to use a scanner and the subsequent steps of digitization, I refer you to a program I recorded last year on this topic. You can find the recording, The Home Archivist Digitizing Your Photo Collection on the library's YouTube channel. When you scan documents and photos, remember to always scan in full color, even if the object is in black and white. Set the resolution, which is referred to as DPI or dots per inch. In other words, the number of printed dots contained within, within one inch of an image printed by a printer. Basically, so the more dots per inch, the more detailed and smooth your scan will look. For paper documents like letters, scan at 300 dpi and choose either JPEG or PDF as the file format. For photographs, scan at least 600 dpi. Higher if it's a tiny photograph like two by three, or if you want to print a larger size than the original. I would choose the TIFF format, especially if you want to edit the photos or need a good quality print. Keep in mind that TIFFs are large files that take a little longer to scan and take up more space on your computer or other storage media. And I'll talk, about more, talk more about this shortly. For slides, scan at 2400 to 3200 DPI and choose the TIFF format for the reasons I mentioned. When scanning fragile papers or photos, keep them in their archival plastic sleeves or Mylar L sleeves for support. You can scan through the plastic and the paper will be protected if you need to turn it over to scan the other side. For oversized photos and documents that won't fit on the scanner bed, use a digital camera or your cell phone camera. You can set the resolution or DPI with a digital camera and the, in the case of a more professional camera, even the file format, but the resolution of photos taken with a phone is dependent on the phone's camera quality. In other words, the number of megapixels. Newer devices usually have better quality cameras. If you don't already have a flatbed scanner or don't wanna make that purchase, you can scan using an app on your smartphone or tablet. There are a number of different apps for both Apple and Android devices. Some are free and others you pay for upgraded features. Check online for reviews and recommendations. Again, you can't set the resolution, which is DPI, like with a flatbed scanner. The resolution is dependent on your device's camera quality. After scanning your paper documents and photographs, you need to digitally store and maintain those scans properly. Think of it like the digital version of storing physical objects. 
These scans or files should be saved to and backed up on different types of storage media. The more digital copies of something you have in different locations, the better, just in case one of those copies fails. And as you know, this can happen with technology. So what kind of storage media should you use? Your computer or laptop's hard drive is one type of storage. But certain file formats, like TIFFs, which you use with photos, can be large and take up a lot of space on, and computers are vulnerable to viruses and crashes. That's why you should also save your files to an external hard drive. These are relatively inexpensive and hold a lot of data. You can always use more than one and keep the second hard drive off-site for added insurance. Finally, you can use cloud or internet storage. There are many options out there with different price points and storage capacities, so you'll have to do some research to find out which one is right for you. Digital storage has to be maintained, so make sure to check your storage media annually. Open up a few random files on your computer and external hard drives to make sure you can still access them. Keep up to date with any policy or access changes with your cloud storage. It's a good idea to replace your external hard drives every three to five years, because unfortunately, they don't last forever. If there is something really special among your family heirlooms that you feel needs repair or special cleaning, consult a professional conservator or preservation specialist. Don't attempt to do it yourself. Here are some places you can turn to for help. The Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. They are excellent, and we have used their services for items in our archival collections. I mentioned the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts earlier. They're the organization that has preservation leaflets available online. You can search for a professional in your area on the American Institute for Conservation's website. They are headquartered in Washington, DC. Remember, conservation doesn't replace the need for preservation. Preservation has to be addressed first, and that is something you can do. So here are your next steps in preservation summed up. Move your heirlooms out of the attic, basement, or garage. As you're going through your stuff, start organizing and categorizing and keep collections together. Prepare artifacts for storage. Clean, identify if you can, document with photos, and reformat. Store in proper protective enclosures. Now, if the purchasing process seems overwhelming or too expensive, keep in mind that what directly touches an artifact should be acid-free, lignin-free, and PAT-passed material. So think tissue paper, folders, and sleeves. Buy additional layers like acid-free boxes if and when you can afford them. Monitor the temperature, humidity, and light in your storage and display spaces and make adjustments as needed. Remember to check your collections regularly. And finally, do no harm. If you feel an object needs special attention, don't try to fix it yourself. Consult a professional conservator. Some of the websites and resources I mentioned can be found on the local history department's page. Go to www.plainfieldlibrary.info and find the local history homepage under departments. When you're on the department's homepage, scroll down to digital archives and indexes. Here you'll find a direct link to local history's recorded programs on YouTube. Look for the home archivist series of videos where I go more in depth about caring for and digitizing your photo collection. There's also an online archives and preservation brochure under publications with embedded links to archival supply vendors, useful websites and archival organizations. Thank you so much for joining me today for, for today's program. I hope you found it informative.